somehow, you know, they're in the Middle East, especially in Manila. There's so much traffic, so much pollution, so much cars and everything that, you know, finding a sheep or a goat even is, is kind of like something difficult. But there is the time in the Bible, shepherds about, okay, they're like all over the place. Even today, when you go to Israel, you still see a lot of Bedouins, these are the local natives and so forth. And they, they still have their herds of sheep and goats and all kinds of animals. And they would just bring them out to the field and, you know, go about their daily life as they did hundreds and thousands of years ago. So when we talk about this kind of thing, we have to imagine, take ourselves back to that time. Okay? Now when we go to Australia or New Zealand, they have a lot of sheep. They say New Zealand, you have more sheep here than people. Okay, so it's hard for us to imagine. Now, the Bible often uses the analogy of sheep and shepherds to, to kind of illustrate a very important point. It goes to show that how sheep are animals that are so dependent, and yet at the same time, they are in need of leading, and you have these people around taking care of them, and they are called shepherds. So throughout many passages of scripture, we have these illustrations and um, ideas related to shepherds and, and sheep. Now by the way, the term sheep is both a singular and a plural. Okay, I was looking for the plural for sheep, and it's sheep. <laughs> okay, anyway, when we talk about this kind of thing, you know, we have a lot of characters in the Bible that were shepherds. For instance, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David even were shepherds at one point or another in their career. Now oftentimes kings and priests were often related to as shepherds because they are the ones taking care of the people entrusted to them. So figuratively, they're called shepherds as well. And priests as well because they're known as the ones who are taking care of these uh, uh, the flocks, the religious community. So you have a lot of illustrations in the past. These are drawings and so forth that they found in the catacombs. Catacombs are the tombs of the early Christians. And they were depicting the scene of Christ as the great shepherd. Notice that Christ back then didn't have a beard. That's how we always imagine Christ to be. Anyway, the point here is this. The Bible also talks about Jesus as our shepherd. Now, this passage of scripture that we want to look at today in John chapter 10 is a very unique one. Uh, but to, uh, to understand this passage correctly, we need to understand its context in which it's written. Last time, we probably, in the past, uh, probably talked about John chapter 9, about the blind man that was healed by Jesus, and somehow he was rejoicing, and the Pharisees came up to him and, and started to wonder what happened to this guy. And the Pharisees, in other words, did not believe in the rejected Christ. Now I want to keep in context to this passage of scripture because this is where it follows. After Jesus encountered this rejection, Jesus is teaching the people that, um, in a way, he's repudiating the Pharisees, okay? And because of his rejection, for the fact that he is the one from God. Now, we have to understand that Jesus started to come before these people and started to tell, me, uh, tell these people um, a story, okay, after they heard what happened in chapter 9. Jesus started talking to them and says, very, very, or truly, truly, I say to you, Pharisees. So he was talking to the Pharisees here. And then, he talks about the story about the good shepherd or the true shepherd, the one who is real from the one who is not real. Now, first of all, he depicts an imagery of the true shepherd. Now, you know, for every Jew living in that period of time, the shepherd idea is something very familiar. Okay, because anybody who lives in that day and age, including the Pharisee, should understand this because it's all around. It's just like today when you talk about, you know, the latest gadgets and the latest stuff on Facebook, okay? 
if you are from this generation, you should know about these things. Okay? But if you're from a different context, you cannot figure it out. Now, if you're in that category, the Pharisees should know everything about what they engage. However, when Jesus is telling them this illustration, they could not understand what Jesus is telling them about. First of all, Jesus paints a picture of what is the true shepherd supposed to be. He says, he is one who enters into the sheep pen through the gate or through the front door. In other words, if you're real, you don't have to worry. You can just walk in through the front door. Now, put yourself in this position. If you're going to go home to your house, most likely you will go in through the door, not through the back door or through the window. Okay? Only thieves do that. So this is a rightful owner or the one who is real, legitimate, has the guts to come in through the front door. Now, I used to live in this house in, in the States when I was growing up, where it has, we have this front door. Okay? We also have a back door, but we usually just go through the front door. We go home, we have the keys to the door. But when you walk in through the front door, everybody sees you going through the front door. Nobody thinks of anything. Oh yeah, all right, how are you? That's my neighbor. Okay, fine. You're welcome because that's your house. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And you also know that we're in a broad daylight where everybody can see you, it's fine. And then, in contrast, when the thieves, Jesus is telling the thieves, he said, I'm not a thief. Because the thief only comes at night when nobody can see you. And when usually when you're out at night, they come and then they try to find little ways around the house to see if there's any way that they can force an entry that they cannot be seen. I remember years ago living in that same house. We were out one night, and when we came home, our house was ransacked. We were robbed. And when we discovered how the thief came in, the thief did not come in through the front door. I mean, this is quite obvious, and he didn't come during the daytime. He came at night, and it was through the backyard where it's secluded with a little window going to the basement. They crawled into that space, and it was able to enter into the house. Now that's the nature of thieves. That's what Jesus is saying here. The, the thief will climb through the gate at night and not going through the front door. Because they have something to hide. Your intent is not good. You are illegal. So Jesus illustrates this very simple thing of how the thief and the rightful order enters the house. The second point that he, met, um, he, he makes here is that it talks about recognition of those inside. Now, inside the sheep pen, I'll show you a picture later of what the sheep pen looks like. Jesus says, you know, the shepherd will come in through the sheep pen, and so as he comes in the sheep pen, when he starts calling the sheep out to bring them out to the pasture line. Because the idea is this, in the ancient times, they used to have a sheep. And at night, the sheep will be kept inside. There's be a stone wall around it to protect them from wolves and other wild animals and thieves and so on at night. And during the daytime, we have one little gate, we have a night watchman who watch it at night. And when the shepherd comes in the morning, they will come in and take over and call the sheep out of this gate. They will go to the pasture now, spend the day feeding and grazing and doing what they need to do. And then afterward, they will lead them back to the safety of the pen. And how the, the person does it is the shepherd will call them out. And usually, you have more than one shepherd keep their sheep in the same thing. Okay? But the unique thing about sheep is this. The sheep, so when they hear their master or their shepherd's voice, they would be able to follow them. That's the unique thing about sheep. What I know about sheep is that they're not a very smart animal. Okay? They're very cute. They're very simple-minded. They're great followers. Okay? But they're not as smart as the person. We need somebody to be. However, although they're not so intelligent, they're not dumb. They can recognize voices. They have voice recognition. Okay? So when you have two shepherds and you have two groups in one group, when this shepherd starts calling the sheep, immediately from among the group, the sheep will follow the rightful owner. And the other group, uh, sheep will follow theirs. And eventually they will go on a separate path. You know, it's automatic. Okay? That's how great sheep are. 
And this is what Jesus is talking about. Everybody knows that this is a very common thing. Okay? So, Jesus starts telling this story. It's a very simple, familiar story to everybody. And the point here was the imagery or this language that Jesus is talking. The Pharisees couldn't understand what he was saying. All of a sudden, something very straightforward, very simple, very direct story. The Pharisees are like sitting there saying, like, So, you're telling us this, this story of everyday life. What's the point? You know, Jesus, when he was teaching, he was talking in a different level. He was talking in a spiritual level, not just merely the story. <laughs> However, the Pharisees were looking for answers, but yet they could not perceive what Jesus was trying to say. Now, let's keep in mind that the Pharisees were very intelligent people. They were the leaders, they're highly trained, they, they knew the word of God very well. However, they were not discerning on the level in which Jesus wanted to understand. What Jesus is trying to say in this passage of scripture has a spiritual meaning. But these Pharisees, although they were very knowledgeable about the word of God, yet they could not perceive the spiritual message. So what was Jesus trying to teach these people during that time? Well, Jesus is basically saying, you guys are supposed to be the shepherds of the people of this world. You're the religious leaders. You're entrusted with the souls of all these people, God's chosen people. And yet, you're a You're not doing your jobs properly because you yourself are not even spiritually qualified in yourself. Jesus' message to them was such that it was so direct, and yet, at the same time, they could not. Jesus is confronting them with this very simple illustration right in front of their faces. And yet, at the same time, they could not perceive the spiritual tone of what Jesus is trying to teach them. In other words, they are nothing more than the blind leading the blind. That is why Jesus is declaring himself as the good shepherd, the rightful shepherd who came. Jesus is the real one. He's the real thing who's not about him, the bits of his people. And yet these false shepherds are sitting here condemning him and saying all the things that you, you have done, the miracles that you have performed, fine, you can do all that, but we still don't believe So the first point here is that Jesus, by giving this story, is teaching the people that he is the real shepherd. And then he moves on and he continues to talk about another thing about himself. That he's not only a real shepherd, but he's also a good shepherd. Starting in verse 7, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with this portion of scripture. Jesus started to teach about himself. He says again, to repeat again, because they couldn't understand it the first time. Truly, truly, I say it to you. In other words, you know, this is really the truth. I'm telling you the truth, okay? I am the gate of the sheep. Now, in order to understand that phrase, we need to know what he's talking about, okay? As I say, I may be able to have shepherds, we don't have sheep, okay? During that time, sheep used to stay in places like this. Okay, and there's a little cove here in the stone, and, you know, notice the terrain is very rugged, it's very flat, and sometimes, you know, during that time there's no street lights at all, so at night it's really dark. Okay? And sheep are very vulnerable. They cannot defend themselves. They're very innocent beings, you know, animals, and, and they just sit there and they sleep and then the wolf can creep up at them at night and kind of overpower them. Now the sheep are dependent creatures. So the shepherds would do these kind of things. They would build a structure, usually this stone wall thing that's about, you know, I don't know how, how many meters high, but it's enclosed completely. And the only way to get into that sheep pen is through one little gate. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying in this illustration. I am the gate. In other words, I am this fortress that acts as two 
different things. Why? It encloses, and yet at the same time, it includes. You can go into this room, and at the same time, those who are not invited or rightfully belonging there will be kept out, and those who are in will be protected. Jesus is saying, I am the king. And the shepherd's role is to guard that king for the sheep. So Jesus is teaching that to the people and says, you know what? This thing here leads to life. And literally it does. Because if the animals do not have this kind of protection of this little pen that night, their life is at risk every single night. Because they're predators, there's wild animals around that that can creep up on them, jump them, and eat them that night. So what happened is that Jesus used this illustration and says, this provides life for them. Now, when Jesus is talking about this, he's talking about many, many different things. That he's the one responsible for watching over the shoes. And in many ways, he says, in contrast, the thieves are always on the lookout to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Notice that Jesus is using a contrast here. He's contrasting himself as the one who gives life, and to give life more abundantly, in contrast to the opposite, the intent of the thief is to steal, kill, and to destroy. This is very reminiscent of David's Psalm 23. You know, we're all very familiar with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, and so forth. Now, when we look at that passage of scripture, it talks about what the Lord does for us. And in many ways, this is what Jesus is doing for us here. In Psalm 23, verses 1 to 4, it says, oh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be what? In other words, I shall not nothing. There's nothing that I lack. Just like the sheep inside this pen lacks nothing. They don't need to fear that they're going to be eaten by a, a wolf that night. They don't have to worry about their food. They don't have to worry about you know, their, their security needs, their physical needs, their safety needs, everything is taken care of them. And then Psalm 23 also talks about he makes me lie down in the pastures. In other words, you can rest. God gives us rest. In the safety of his place, the sheep do not have to be afraid. There I go again, I use the word sheep. There's no such word as sheep. The sheep can just lie down and relax and don't have to worry about anything. Just like in Psalm 23, he makes me lie down in the pastures. And he leads me besides quiet waters. You know, during the daytime, you know, the sheep do not spend the whole day inside that thing. Oh, yeah. Man. During the daytime, the shepherd will lead them out. And once they lead them out to the good places, to the water, to the water hole, to the pastures and so on. Now life is great. They don't have to worry about anything. What we're going to go tomorrow, what they're going to do, what they're going to eat. They don't have to worry about where the food is going to be and what time of the year. And during that time, they have different growing seasons. In some seasons, they don't have grass. They have to go somewhere else to get that. The sheep don't have to worry about anything. Because that's all in the mind and, and in, the, in the work of the shepherd. You're, you're supposed to find these places and be the sheep. So there's nothing to be afraid for them. And then not only that, when they're out in the field, the shepherd will protect them. Okay? And then so forth. And then, you know, this is all figured in Psalm 23 for us. And not only that, he refreshes our soul, he guides me along paths of righteousness for his name's sake, and so forth. So we can see all these things that a good shepherd does for us. Because he not only provides the gateway of life, but he also provides the security for If you're inside, you're safe. If you're outside gazing, you're also safe. That's what Jesus is saying. In me, there is no Because in me, you do not only get eternal life and security, but you also get to enjoy the daily blessings of being. Okay, so, so this is what Jesus is saying about himself as a good shepherd. And then going on, we 
You see, Jesus talks about himself as the dependable shepherd. Okay? He's not only, <coughs> he's not only the real one, he's not only the good one, but he's also the dependable one. You know, sometimes shepherds can be lazy shepherds. Okay? I mean, you can have good shepherds and you have bad lazy shepherds. Just like when you have employees, you can have good employees or you can have lazy employees. Now Jesus is saying he's, he's not like that. He's not just a hired man. He is a dependable shepherd. Notice in verse 12, he starts talking about the hired man. Is he not the shepherd? There's a big difference between the hired man and the shepherd. And since the hired man is only doing it for the job. But the shepherd is doing it because he loves him. You know, I don't know about being in the workplace, okay? For those of you who are working, do you love your job? Or you hate it? Or you're working just for the money, just to pass the day to pay the bill? You know, the attitude is very different, okay? If you really love your job, you're passionate about the job, it's something very fulfilling, you would do very well. But if you can't stand it when you're waiting for the clock, Out. You know, if people are always counting like that, it makes it very hard if we always try to cut corners. They try to go to the sea out for a long time. You know, sometimes you go to the kind of expected for a little bit more, you know. And Jesus said, No, I'm not a very dependable one. I'm like that of like those people who, who cut corners and things like that. Now, why is he telling that? He said he is the dependable shepherd of his spirit. Because when we look at the context of this passage, he's talking about Israel and why he is so different from those people who are there that are supposed to be their shepherds, but they are not good shepherds, but just high pants. Talking about the Pharisees. He's saying that the Pharisees during those days are entrusted with the sheep of Israel. And yet at the same time, they're in it for the country. You're in it for the thing. You're in it for all these things. And when the trouble comes, guess what? They don't want to have any responsibilities. You just throw the responsibility to somebody else. You just do things to protect your self-interest and have no need for the interest of God. In this passage of scripture, it is very like that. It says, so when you see the wolf come and eat, the abandons the sheep and runs. But when a wolf attacks the flocks, it scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus here on the other hand says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep knows me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So Jesus here is talking about himself as the one who is worthy was dependent to lead the sheep of Israel. And then Jesus goes on in another portion of immediate verse 16 to talk about him as a dependable shepherd for the Gentiles. Notice the language here is very interesting. In this portion of scripture in verse 16, it says, I have other sheep that are not in the sheep. Okay? And when you look at this passage of scriptures, what does Jesus mean? Well, the issue of Israel and the Gentile church is the good interpretation for this. Because when you look at this, Jesus is talking to the Jews. But he's talking about a prophetic thing that is to come. That is the church. That is a separate entity from Israel. So what Jesus is trying to teach these people is that, hey, guess what? You are from this world. You're the Jews. Later on, I have something, another plan. That is called the church. Okay, that's found in the book of Acts and you know, you look at the rest of the Bible. It talks about that. And then, and then the thing is, it says, I have other sheep. And yet, these sheep also hear my voice. Because I don't understand what those things. The Jews thought that they were only one. They thought that they were the only, only chosen people of God. They were the only sheep of God. But Jesus is here telling the people, hey, yeah, you are my sheep, but yet I have another thing to talk about. You also listen to me. And guess what? Not only listen to me, together, you 
going to become one flock and I will be one shepherd. In other words, at the end of the day, the church is comprised not only of Gentiles, but also the Jews. So the two distinct groups will come together to become one big body of Christ. This is what Jesus is talking about. Of course, during that time, people didn't understand because they didn't give him yet. Okay, Jesus is speaking prophecy right here. But nonetheless, for each one of them, Jesus is saying that he is an impenetrable angel. Somebody you can count on. Somebody who is always there for you. And someone who does not cut corners or look at it as just a job. And then going to the fourth point, Jesus declares himself as the faithful shepherd. Now this passage of scripture seems not fitting in the whole context of it. But to understand this is very significant. He says the reason my father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. Now this is a prophecy talking about his resurrection. No one takes it from me. I lay down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This is the command I received from my father. In other the book of John, the book of John always make a point to talk about Jesus as the obedient uh, son of God. He always talk about doing the will of the Father. And this is another example of that. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is saying that he is a faithful shepherd to his sheep as well as to his father. Because his father ultimately God is the owner of all things. You know, we are living in this world. We are all fathers, the, the fathers of each day. God is the father of us all. The thing is, he gives us the opportunity to become his sheep, to be part of his fold. Jesus is the one who makes it possible for us to join into the fold of the Father through himself. And what Jesus is talking about has to do with his death on the cross and how he died for each one of us. And how, by coming to know him individually, we can become part of his flock. And Jesus says, you know, unless he does that, it's not going to be possible for us to belong to God. So Jesus said here is that I was faithful and I will be faithful to you as well. So Jesus is not only faithful to his father's blood, but he's also faithful to his father's will. What the father wants him to do, he does. Although he has a choice, he chooses to do God's will rather than on his will. And then the last part, after Jesus is speaking all these things to the Pharisees, the Pharisees Hey, was totally scared. And when the Jews heard these words, hear again, they, they were again involved. Many of them said, He is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? And others said, These are not saints of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the Lord? In other words, they're going back to chapter. Notice that all this is related to chapter 9 about the healing of the blind man. And the Pharisees, suddenly when they hear what Jesus had to say, the truth that was revealed to them was such that it caused so much controversy. First of all, some of the Jews in that group were divided by the truth. When they heard the truth from Jesus, Many of them were debating, this is kind of seem the right thing. Oh, I think he is something that's right. But the others were saying, no, it's impossible. How can that be? So somehow truth has a way to do that thing. Especially if you do not know the truth and you start to hear the truth, truth is very confrontational. It affects you. It causes controversy, especially when you're Fed with all kinds of things. And then not only that, many people were offended by the truth. You know, to be offended by the truth is the easiest thing. 
Have anybody ever come up to you and say something that's truthful in you that you don't like? Truth hurts sometimes. And you know, sometimes truth is the truth, the naked truth, and nothing there to make it pretty. And sometimes we don't like to look at the truth or face the truth. We like to deny it. And one of the ways that we deny truth, one of the easiest ways to deny truth, is to get angry. Because anger has a way of making you feel that you are in control. And once you start to do that, you start to get angry and lash out. We're seizing control of ourselves and not having to face the realities of the future. That's why the counseling they always teach us, you know, when you want to counsel people, and when you touch on something very sensitive, when somebody gets mad, they say, ah, that's the problem. They don't want to face it. They're trying to seize control of that. And that's what happened to these Pharisees. When Jesus started telling them, some of them understood. But a lot of them did not face the things. They looked at themselves and said, no, we can't do that because there's too much cost in that. There is too much to lose. If we submit ourselves to this Jesus, it we're admitting defeat. And there goes our credibility. There goes our life. And it goes our way of life, our lifestyle, that we have accomplished all these years. We're going to risk all that. And for many of them, they just could not accept that. And not only that, the truth of Jesus also caused many to be perfect. Many people were confused. They started asking questions. They started feeling uncertain about themselves. You know, that's what Jesus does. That's what God does when He commands us. He says all these things to us, but sometimes we have to remember truth may hurt, but truth is what He is. And that's what the great shepherd does for us. He does not lead us and continue to lead us in denial of reality. He leads us in a holistic way, not only to provide for our physical needs, not only provide for our safety needs, but also their psychological and whole being wellness. He wants us all to be whole like him. That's how great a shepherd is. He loves us so much, he wants the best. And also, when we look at all these things, there is so much depth. So in application, how can we apply it? Well, the Lord is our real shepherd. Therefore, by this fact, we need to love Him and give Him thanks. We need to praise His name because He is the real one. We're not following some crazy guy who's a demon possessed guy or somebody who is a lunatic or something like that. He's real. Although we cannot see him, he is the real. So this is reason enough for us to praise his name and give thanks to him. Secondly, the Lord is our good shepherd. He always seeks the best for us. Therefore, we should not worry like a sheep. We're always secure. We just have to trust that He's leading us in the direction that is good for our He weighs us, He leads us in the way of righteousness. He makes us lie down with the pastors. He leads us beside the quiet waters. And sometimes we may not know where He's leading us. And sometimes it may be scary to trust in this leading. But you know, at the end of the day, this leading is always the best. And third, he ought this our dependable shepherd. We do not need any other shepherd. In other words, there is nothing else out there. We can count on him to defend us. He's not a hiding. He really loves us and wants to do all these things for us. And not only that, Jesus is also our 
faithful to God. We need to be faithful and obedient to Him as He is faithful and obedient to His Father. That the Father asks Him to die on the cross for our sins. Likewise, we need to be obedient just as He is obedient. And also, lastly, the Lord is our truthful creation. It's no such thing that we need to seek His forgiveness and always to God. His truth may be hard to understand. It may be difficult for us to apply. And sometimes we really want to face it. But at the end, it's hard. That's where healing is. So all these things about the Good Shepherd, it's, it's not just something feelable. It has been. And there's a reason for all these things in this portion of scripture. May the Lord continue to help us as we kind of contemplate on this passage of scripture. And as we read through it, let us see the picture of Christ as somebody who is over us and leading us to God. Let us close the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this rich portion of scripture. All the more. It can be inspirational. It can sound like a poetry. It sounds so good. It makes us have this feeling of, of security. But yet, at the same time, we know that it's much, much deeper than that. That it occurred in the time and place that this passage of scripture was written. When Jesus was talking about himself to a group of people that did not know him, did not care. Lord, we pray that as we meditate on this passage of Scripture, that what we learn about Christ and His revelation about Himself, as the Lord Shepherd, and all those other virtues that He needs, help us to be able to appreciate the richness of who Christ is in our life. Lord, as we study through this book of John, we are reminded once again that Christ is in you. That all these things that Christ did is to lead us to Him. And not only for us to know Him, but to know Him in a deeper way. To be able to depend on Him. To be able to trust Him. To be able to uh, rely on Him and His truth revealed to us. We pray that through this reflection by the Good Shepherd that will make us better sheep, better followers, and that we would not only just follow you, but also know the shepherd God, as you know each one of us. But yet at the same time, we thank you so much for the comfort of this passage of scripture. That we're reminded once again that you do care for our every needs. But we know that each one of us have our own needs. Some of us may have physical needs, financial needs. Emotional needs, relational needs, and so forth. But yet, the good shepherd will remind us again that you are one step ahead of us in all those things. That you know exactly what our struggles are. You have a plan for all of us. In you, we don't have to worry because you are taking care of all the needs of us. You're always keeping us safe. Always leading us. What else 